Well, good evening. Good evening and welcome everyone. What a great turnout. It is so exciting to look up into this crowd and see everyone in the, in the stands, in the seats, some familiar faces, some new faces. Thank you all so much for coming. My name is Elizabeth Simmons. I'm Vice President of External Affairs at the Academy. Uh, so before we start to kick things off, I do have a brief safety minute. Uh, should there be an emergency and we need to evacuate, we have exit doors located on either side of the room. There's also exit doors up at the top of the stairs. I feel like we should be on an airplane right now if the mask comes down. No. Um, restrooms are located uh, um, either around the corner. And then also if you want to head up, see, I, I could work for an airline, head up the stairs down the hall on your left. Uh, we do also ask folks to please silence any technology that you might have. Um, so that would be great. So with that out of the way, I not only love working at the Academy, I'm a proud graduate and honored to be a board member with the Chatham Marconi Maritime Center. Through their hard work and dedication, we're pleased to host this evening's event and to welcome everyone to campus. Gorgeous night out. Before handing things over to Bob Fishback, president of the Chatham Marconi Maritime Center, it's a privilege to welcome one of our favorite shipmates, a graduate from the class of 1975 and 2014 honorary degree recipient, our very own Captain Rich Phillips. So with that, Bob, please come up to the podium for our official introduction. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bob Fishback. You've probably heard that three times already. Um, I'll say it again. President of Chatter Marconi Maritime Center. We want to thank Admiral McDonald and Captain Elizabeth Simmons and the entire Maritime Academy of Community, community for hosting tonight's event. On behalf of the center, I'm pleased to welcome everyone, including family, friends, and guests, to this special presentation in our Ed Fui speaker series. It's wonderful to be here with this audience, and we're pleased to see such a large audience turn out for Captain Phillips. <clears throat> here in Admiral's Hall, and we have a Zoom audience of uh, probably a, by now a similar size, uh, watching this at home and live streaming at our education center back in Chatham. This year, the center is celebrating its 20th anniversary. The center is located on a, in a historic campus commissioned by Guglielmo Marconi in the early 1900s. The site was once the busiest ship to shore communication station in the United States, and it was a, was a significant military installation during World War II. Today, through our Marconi RCA Wireless Museum and a range of science and informational programs for children and adults, the center celebrates both the history of the 20th century maritime radio and the innovative advances in science and technology that continue to transform our lives. Among those informational programs are our regular monthly speaker series and special Ed Cooey speaker events such as this. Ed was an award-winning broadcast journalist and in retirement, a Chatter Marconi volunteer. The Ed Fui Speaker Series was established in his memory to promote knowledge and understanding of history and world events with a special focus on communications technology and its profound effect on our lives. When we established the series in 2015, we wanted to offer something special to Chatter Marconi's audiences. That's true on many levels this evening. Our speaker series began as a summer series, excuse me, a summer evening program in a small museum gallery and is now offering vibrant year-round programs where online video conferencing technology enables us to reach audiences far beyond Cape Cod. Guglielmo Marconi was an inventor who would no doubt be fascinated by the technology involved in the live streaming process. Ed Fui brought essential news stories to viewers of the then three major television networks and would likely be excited by the interactive nature of this event made possible by innovations in technology since his time. Most importantly, a captain's duty is a compelling personal story and a modern pirate adventure as it turned straight out of Hollywood. Before we begin, I want to make a few acknowledgements. It took a lot of people and planning to pull this together and I want to thank everyone involved for their efforts. Special thanks to Captain Elizabeth Simmons and Captain Jim Fitzpatrick, who are both, I'm pleased to report, 
members of the board of Chatter Marconi, and they have done yeoman work. I think that's probably a key notion, but yeoman work uh, in coordinating this event here at the Academy on our behalf. To the production team here at Mass Maritime, Dave Riddiford and Jeff Biznet, and our own people in from Chatham Marconi, down in front of you here, Ron Ferris, Ed Moxon, Harry Pitnoff, and Tom England. Our remote hosts back at Chatham Marconi, Rich Simmons and Elise Gordon, and for logistics coordination here at Mass Maritime, Dana Ferris, and from our own staff, John and Julie Durney. A special thanks to our speaker series producer and mastermind, Liz McCart. A few high <laughs> That's for everyone. Liz is turning bright red, but the camera's not there. Uh, I would reiterate, if you would please uh, give your electronic equipment a lobotomy for the next hour, that would be very much appreciated. Uh, following his presentation and time permitting, Captain Phillips will answer a few questions from the audience. Here at, here at Mass Matter Time, live questions from the Chatham Marconi campus, written questions submitted to the host there. And from the home audience, enter your questions at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and typing in your question. Finally, for those of you here at Admiral's Hall, following the Q&A period, Captain Phillips will sign his book, A Captain's Duty, in the lobby. Copies are for sale by Titcombe's Bookshop. Our speaker tonight, Richard Phillips, is a graduate of Massachusetts Maritime Academy, a member of the International Organization of Masters, Mates, and Pilots Union, and a licensed American merchant mariner. He became captain of the motor vessel Niersk, Alabama in 2008. Captain Phillips married Andrea Coggio in 1987, and they have two children, Mariah and Danny, and they reside in Underhill, Vermont. Tonight, our speaker will share his story, the, the story of the Miersk, Alabama's now famous encounter with Somali pirates from his personal perspective and the lessons of leadership, seamanship, and courage that the incident highlighted. It is my pleasure to introduce Captain Richard Phillips. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. But before I start, I, I just want to thank you for coming out and supporting uh, the Marconi Museum. Uh, uh, definitely the maritime history here, and also uh, uh, the Captain Phillips Lane Kirkland Maritime Trust, which uh, 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 provides scholarships to not only students here at Mass Maritime, the six other maritime schools, the one school, and also technical. Basically, uh, it was uh, started to uh, enlighten on what we do at, at, at sea, we're the truck drivers of the ocean, and try and raise money to try and get more and more people into the merchant marine uh, profession that I think uh, re really uh, has its upside. Whether you work on the bridge of a ship, the engine room of a tanker, uh, the business room of a, a dry dock, uh, people in the mar maritime industry is very important. I know all the students here know how important it is. Uh, but we're very integral for the defense and the economy of, of the United States. So I just want to thank you for coming out and supporting the, the, the two groups. Thank you. It, it was hot. Uh, I was nervous. Heck, I was afraid. I was scared the, the entire time. I was worried. I, I really didn't know how it would, it would all end up. But enough about my wedding day. <laughs> Let me get to what you brought me here to discuss. Uh, in our time together today, I get to share with you an extraordinary experience that affected my life. And you and I can take a look at some of uh, the lessons I learned in a uh, unique situation can have an impact upon us personally, professionally. But, but first, before I get into it, let me just give you a little bit about my background. After graduating from Massachusetts Maritime Academy in 1979, I spent the next 12 years on various types of ships, gaining the experience necessary that will allow me to sit and take a test for my second mate, to my chief mate, to my captain's license, all while sailing on all the oceans of the world. I, I sat for my test in 1991, I passed it, and, and, I, and I started sailing almost immediately as a captain. Uh, like a lot of captains, I worked 90 days on a ship, and then I uh, spent 90 days at home. 
I've been gone for as long as six months straight at a time. And as you can imagine, this creates a different type of home life than many of my friends and neighbors, indeed, maybe many of you here today. For example, how many of you said to your spouse or significant other, uh, honey, we're going to make a decision here. I, I have to be back to work in January. Or when I go for my 90-day commute, I give my wife a honey-do list. And when I return later, three months later, she hands it back to me with more on it. So, don't get me wrong, it does have its advantages. While millions of people deal every day with morning and afternoon rush hour traffic, all I have to do is roll out of the rack, climb a ladder, and, and I'm at the office. And, and many don't know the job description of a captain. It's very terse, very succinct. It's to ensure the safety of the crew, the ship, and the cargo in that order and in that priority. Well, uh, you know, I, I've been, uh, I, I've known a lot of people who've been through a lot of tough, tougher things than I have. And they've all said the same thing to me, almost to the very word. And they say, uh, you know, uh, uh, I wouldn't wish that on, uh, on anybody, even my worst enemy, some of them say. But I'm sort of glad I went through it, because they said, I learned some important things uh, 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 about myself. And uh, I'd like to share with you three of the major points that I'll be talking about today. And, and they're not just uh, from my experience of, from Somali pirates, but it's also my many years of sailing as a captain, the floating CEO, if you will, uh, 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 monitoring a highly d different crew and navigating challenging and constantly changing seas. And, and just as you folks have been through a tough time these last few years, that's pretty much what I went through in, 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 in that lifeboat. As just as you've had to take care of your families, your teams, your crews, your pods, uh, that's what I had to do in that lifeboat. And even when information was changing at a weekly, monthly, let's face it, daily rate in the last few years, uh, you still had to maintain, uh, maintain your calm and, 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 and show people that we were heading in the right direction, even if at times, you didn't think so. And the, you still had to face the high potential of, of death and still act like we were going in the, in, in the right direction, maintaining your composure. You, you basically had to plan for the future in a precarious present. You had to become comfortable with uncertainty. And, and much like I was in that lifeboat. Uh, the three facts I want you to know are, first, you are much stronger than you even know. You can do more, and you can take more. The strength, it's already within you. Secondly, nothing is completely lost until we choose to give up. Failure is only final when we give up, give in, or quit. And last, lastly, a dedicated, motivated team working together can overcome most any problem or, or solve, most, uh, uh, solve mo most any problem, the, the sum being greater than the parts. Uh, now, now, I don't think anybody here, or most anybody here, maybe outside the cadets, will be fighting pirates anytime soon. But I do know that we all have pirate-like things in our personal life that we have to deal with and overcome. And uh, that, that's one thing a Navy SEAL once said, everybody encounters adversity in their life. Sometimes it's small, sometimes life-changing. How you handle it starts and stops with you. And he also said, and, uh, and, and I highly agree with him, I've seen this in the real thing, I've seen this in training, I've seen this in events. Attitude will always impact and determine that final result. Now, let's go ahead and start our voyage. I had sailed in this area of the world almost exclusively for four, four and a half years. And I've always told my crews during that time that a pirate attack, a security situation was, was a matter of when. Not if, but I thought we could handle it. If we had procedures in place, if we planned for the worst, uh, uh, I, thought, I thought we could uh, handle it. And one of the first things I no noticed when I took over as captain of the ship was that security was, was kind of lax, wasn't where it should have been, wasn't where it was going to stay. So I decided after a couple days, we'd have a surprise, unannounced drill to, 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 to see where my crew stood. As a captain, I'm only required to do these quarterly. And that box had been checked. But I think, as I said, uh, for any type of leader, I, 
Uh, I think you really have to know with boots on the ground what's going on, and, and you have to plan for the worst. Or you, we are the leaders, and we have to realize that. We have the responsibility. And as a captain, I, 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 highly, I think it's highly important to be creative in this situation. I believe training will get us through what we've experienced before. Creative approaches and imagination will get us through what we've yet to encounter. So at, at, uh, at 9 a.m., I'm on the bridge, and I start the, uh, I start the, the drill. I walk up to the bridge to the, my officer and my sailor, and I announce to them that there's a small boat with four armed guys coming at us uh, in a hostile manner. I, I don't know what other manner they'd, they'd come at us in. And, and the drill lasted about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, in the critique, where I pull all my crew together, we talk about things that went wrong, things we could do better, uh, and come up with new ideas, lasted three times that long, which, which was norm normal for my drill. Uh, I think it's important to critique our shortcomings as well as our successes. Just because we did it well the first time doesn't mean you can't do it better the next, not being complacent. Now, I got to tell you, I've never had a drill. I've never had an event. I've never had a situation go as planned. It, it, it just doesn't happen. And during this drill, we found out that some of my crew didn't know how to sound the signal on the alarm panel. Some didn't know what the signal was. Doors like the door to the engine control room weren't locked. And then I found out that some of my crew didn't know our non-duress passwords, our code words. We didn't sue later, and, and, and some didn't, didn't recognize that. And then during the end, we come up with a new idea. I try to involve my crew. I think it's important to involve them, give them some ownership and responsibility. And during this drill, we came up with an idea of a backup to the safety room we already had, which came into play a few days later. And Anyway, we talked it through, and everybody seemed to get on the same page. Everybody seemed to understand what they had to do and what the guy next to him had to do, because in my experience, you, you never know who shows up uh, in an incident. And everyone seemed to get it. Everyone seemed to know what they had to do and the guy next to him, and, and everyone seemed to get on the same page. Well, everybody but, but this guy, I'll call, uh, I'll call Cliff. I don't know if you remember the TV show Cheers and the character on that show guy with vast amounts of arcane knowledge and many years of, of business, but little common sense or wisdom. Uh, I think there's one in every organization. I had one on my ship. And isn't that the leader's task to raise that bar on, on their weight link? And let me tell you, there, there was some grumbling. Isn't that all the way about training, informational passage and drilling? There was some grumbling on the ship, but a few days later, everybody was real happy. We'd taken the time and plan for the worst. I, I show this slide to give you an idea of a situation that's a three-year period. It shows suspicious activities, uh, hijackings, attempted pirate activity groups. And as you can see, they, they, they had a great business plan in the spring of 2009. They were ranging from just outside the Persian Gulf, all, a third of the way up the Red Sea, all the way south to Madagascar, and all the way over to India and Pakistan. And a few weeks before my incident, they took a super tanker over a thousand foot long ship carrying petroleum products to the U.S. and they took that 2,500 miles off the coast. That green line you see there is, is one 1,000 miles. And uh, like I said, we were real happy they, that we planned for the worst. Now, picture if you will, the vastness of the sea and the darkness of the very night and a voice coming over our ship's VHF radio, sounding very eerie, saying, Somali pirate coming to get you. Somali pirate coming to get you. This is what we heard the night before the incident. The next morning, about 06.30, I was on the bridge with uh, Chief Mate Shane Murphy, another buccaneer, another maritime graduate. He was my chief mate. And as we were having coffee that morning, we both said the same thing. Boy, I can't wait for this monsoon to change. This, this is a perfect piracy day. And, and indeed it was. When the sun came up, there was hardly a blush of wind. The sea laid flat. There was hardly any swell running. It truly was a, a, a perfect piracy day. About 15 minutes later, about 0645, one of the crew on the bridge spots a small, thin, wooden boat, about three, three and a half miles astern, coming on fast, about 20, 
21 knots. We changed course. They changed course. We maneuvered. And they executed and married that same identical maneuver. It was fairly obvious to us what was happening here. Uh, we were in the area of the Indian Ocean where other ships had been attacked by pirates from Somalia. The ships held for ransom and the crews held as hostages and some of those crews tragically killed. We understand the severity of our situation. The mood of my crew ranges from highly concerned to blatantly terrified. We, we get on our ship satellite uh, telephone, which is our, one of our first procedures, and we, and we call up the Piracy Center in Djibouti, the U.S. Piracy Center. We, we didn't get an answer, which wasn't rare. In our drills, we'd call, and we wouldn't always get answers. And then we called the UKMTO, United Kingdom Maritime Transport Organization, an industrial group, which we learned later was basically an apartment by United Arab Emirates, manned by three or four retired British merchants. And then you'd call them, and they'd call somebody else who'd call somebody else, a uh, piracy clearinghouse, if you will. And the three British guys are providing us with lots of great advice. We have uh, a boat with four of our men coming down on us, and they're asking us questions like, are you sure it's not a fishing boat, Captain? We have a lot of nervous captains out there, Captain. Are you sure it's not a fishing boat? And I'm thinking, well, unless they're shooting the fish, probably not. Now the pirates are two miles away. They found that quiet water of our wake. They're coming on even faster. We know we're, we're, that we'll be overtaking. We start getting out our expired rocket-propelled flares, which we keep just for this reason. And we call three of my crew who are up working at 6 that morning on the bow. And we call three of that crew on the radio we have on the ships. And we pull them back to the one door we leave unsecured when anyone's out on deck. And we make sure all the other doors are, are secured. By the time they're one mile away, most of the crew is up. We sound the alarm. We get the crew mustered and staged to get them into our safe room. And at a half mile away, they're coming down the quiet waters of our wake. The third mate and I are on the aft end of that bridge. We have the rocket-propelled flares in hand, the fire pumps fully charged and flowing, the whistles, the, the whistles sounding, the lights are flashing, and the pirate skiff comes right down our six. Pretty soon, the third mate starts firing off these flares, and then I'm firing off the flares. We're, we're trying to give them something to worry about, maybe give them something to concern themselves, perhaps catch their boat on fire. Earlier, I mentioned in the first of my three points is that you are stronger than you even know. And it was at this time with this adventure with the pirates that, that this came into play. You see, they answered my volley of expired rocket propelled flares with the ping, 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 bullets bouncing and ricocheting off the house, the stack, and the hull. And, and that we got the first overt call to my crew over the handheld radio, announced to my crew, Shots fired. Shots fired. Now, my training as a merchant mariner is opposed to say someone in the military didn't really include dodging weapons fired by Somali pirates. Uh, but as I discovered firsthand, when, when in a dangerous or threatening or difficult situation, somewhere within us, we will find the strength to, to do what must be done. And while I was the one on that day, I'm just as sure and confident that you would have, would have and could have done exactly the same. On the ship, we continue our evasive maneuvers, but we, we know we can't change, we, we can't evade them. They come off our port quarter, and now they're about 20 meters off our port side. One of the pirates is sitting cross-legged in that skiff. He's firing his AK-47 up at me as I'm jumping up and down like a jack and box, firing off my flares and then ducking behind the wind dodger while that Pirate in the forward end of that skiff reaches in, holds erect, a beautiful white ladder, and the pirate skiff closes on my port side. With our evasive maneuvering, at first they bounce off the hull. The second time they come back in contact, and before it ricochets off, that pirate in the forward end of that skiff hooks that ladder onto my fish plate, and he starts climbing up the side of the Mask Alabama. And this beget the last of my overt calls to my crew over that Hazel radio, and announced to my crew, Pirates aboard, pirates aboard. By this time, it's, it's me, the third mate, and my sailor up on the bridge as planned. Most of my rest of my crew is hidden in the safe room, and some of my engine crew are locked into the engine control room where they know that they can take control of the ship 
by bypassing the control to the bridge and then shutting the ship down. And because of the drill we had a few days earlier, the doors that should have been locked were locked. We prepared for the worst, and even though the best is yet to happen, we're as ready as we can be. To this point, let's be honest, I feel uh, they got on my ship. Uh, but in difficult situations, you, you can't quit. You have to uh, persevere. And I think it's important you must plan for initial success as well as initial failure. As I said earlier, nothing goes as planned. One by one, the four Somali pirates all climbed aboard the vessel. I don't know if they all planned to come aboard as they were designing their mission. My guess is they didn't use the precise procedures that we had. In fact, I'm pretty sure they had not gone through extensive training for the mission. I know this because after they boarded my ship, their skiff got damaged against the side of the ship. It turned turtle, overturned. The seas wiped the ladder off the ship and both started sinking pretty quickly. Yeah, you don't have to be a sailor to realize that a sinking boat is never a positive development on the high seas. However, now the four Somali pirates are all aboard and they have no way to get off since they lost their skiff. And I think this has made them even more desperate. And this began a, a, a slippery slope for the next 12 or 13 hours, a time of stress, tension, a game of cat and mouse, hide and seek, and Simon says, on a 508-foot ship. And, and unfortunately, uh, I've become part of history. Uh, we're the first U.S. ship to be boarded, attacked, boarded, and taken hostage by pirates since the 1800s, and I personally do not consider that a good thing. But I have to say, they never, the pirates never controlled the ship. They never hijacked the ship. They, they, they got aboard, and they got two of us and myself, but... They, 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 they never controlled it. With the training that we had, my crew was able to act in an innovative new situation on their own. And the training gave them that basics where they could act their own without me. And aren't some of our best leaders willing, happy to let their team, teams take credit, and even more importantly, take action? So I think it's important to remember, we train them. We, 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 we need to let them do their job. I was actually on the corner of the bridge, uh, the bridge wing, Port Bridge Wing. I just fired off the last of my rocket propelled flares and I came into the bridge. My, my next procedure was secure the bridge, head to the safe room with the guys. When out, when out of the corner of my eye, I saw a shadow, I turned. It was one of the pirates, the leader of the pirates I learned later. He had an AK-47. He walked to the Port Bridge Wing, he fired twice. He lowered the gun to the horizontal. And then he walked into the bridge saying, Relax, Captain, relax, no cater, no cater. Relax, Captain, just business, relax, Captain. I was able to turn and with my radio at my hip, I pushed the transmit button and announced to my crew, bridge compromise, pirates on the bridge. In spite of all this, I gotta say, the, the pirates were, were a happy group at first. Why? They learned that we were a United States ship and they thought they were in for a big payday from a rich American steamship company, uh, at least that's what they thought. You see, they were only successful in their first step. They, I think they lost the big picture. Their, their work was not complete, only started. The, and they thought it was over. They, they forgot what their ultimate goal was. And that's something we, or, or on a ship or in any job, we can never forget that. What is our ultimate goal? We can't be distracted, as I said, by initial success or failure. We must always remember what are our ultimate goals. At sea, you can, never, you, you can never count on anybody riding to the rescue. At sea, you can't pass the buck. Unless you yourself take action, uh, a fire can be a disaster. A deep laceration can be a death sentence. A storm can be a catastrophe. You get to see that we're all strong enough to take on difficult, dangerous situations, whether it's a, a broken bone or, or, or a pirate attack. One of the first things the pirates did once they got to the four, got up to the bridge was to go on the satellite phone. They gave me the number. I knew the country code, so I knew it was Somalia. And I, they watched me as I put the number in. And they'd watch to make sure I wasn't fooling around, but it just never went through. And I said, oh, it must be bad cell service. What they didn't know was if you don't push the pound key, it doesn't go through. After they were looking at the phone, they went to the radar. 
That's their next procedure. They would go look for the radar, but look for the mothership, which should be just over the horizon. That's what we saw the day before when we had three skiffs fall with us. And before he got to the radar, I was able to then denigrate that radar, so you wouldn't have seen an aircraft carrier next to us if there had been one that day. And the pirate went to their radar, and now he was confused. He was perplexed. This is their procedure. The mothership's supposed to be there. He's supposed to be waiting for, for, for my telephone call and my VHF. Well, as he was there, I, I changed the VHF from 16 to some number. He went to the VHF next. He called, I assume, in Somali, and he never got an answer. And now he was really perplexed. Now he was really quizzical. He had no, no idea why aren't they waiting. They should be right there. They should be waiting for my call. Uh, during the movie, Tom Hanks said, our strength is our job. And uh, on a ship and almost every job, that is our strength. And I think it's something you have to remember. No one knows the job we do. We, and our strength, is in that. So, but during the incident, I never said that. You could only say that during training, during drills. In an incident, the, the, the amount of talking is, is very, very limited. Uh, and that, that, that's just one thing I wanted to stress, that our jobs, our knowledge, is our strength, and not, and, and not to forget it. But the pirates were happy at first, like I said. And they were even high-fiving each other on the bridge because they thought they were in for a big payday. But they soon discovered they, they had this one big problem. There were two my crew with me on the bridge, my third mate, my AB. They can't find anybody else on the whole ship. And now the lights were twinkling out, the AC went quiet, the rumble of the main engine could no longer be heard. The chief engineer had shut the ship down. We were drifting. We were dead in the water. The pirates were getting mad. They said, make the ship go. I said, I can't make it go. They said, make the ship go, we'll shoot you. I said, I can't make it go, it's your fault. I had to be strong enough to convince them that their problems were their fault, not mine. It, 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 then they constantly queried me, where's the crew? Where's the crew? My answer was always the same. I, I, I don't know where the crew is. I'm, I, I'm here with you. And after a while, they're getting madder. They told me, order the crew to come to the bridge now, or we'll shoot you and the two crew. And I did as I was told. I got the PA system, and I got the handheld radio all through the bridge, all through the bridge. Pirates want all crew the bridge now. But thanks to that drill that we had a few days earlier, the, the, the crew knew the non duress password, the code word. And, and they knew that without me using that code word in my orders, they weren't to do anything I said. Like like playing an adult game with Simon Says. Without me using that code word, everybody knew to stay in hiding. Well, almost everybody. On the bridge, there was auxiliary shut down, there were main engines shut down, multiple alarms going off, uh, very noisy, very hot, and on the bridge door came a knock. The pirates didn't hear that. I was hoping whoever it was would go away. They didn't. It came back. The pirates heard that, and they told me to go over and open up the door. I went over, I, I opened up the door, and remember Cliff, the guy who never gets the memo? Said, come on in, Cliff, you're dead. So now there are three crew with me on the bridge with the four pirates. After a while, they had me lead them through the ship trying to find my missing crew, constantly asking me, where is the crew? Where is the crew? And we would go through the ship, a real Marie Celeste type moment, and which isn't rare, we would go through the crew quarters and we, we would see linen a shunder, uh, clothes in disarray. But what is rare on our ship that morning, and in my haste to get to the safe room, some of the crew left the doors ajar. And as we went through the ship that morning, uh, the doors were just swinging back and forth, something you, you never see on a ship. And we, we went down into the mess deck and we saw the melons all cut off, the full pot of coffee, an area cup taken out. We went into the galley and we saw the bacon, probably cooked at five that morning, but with the eggs sitting next to that griddle for the, for the breakfast that, that would never be. It was, it was very eerie. Then after a while, they, they get tired of me going around to try and help them find the missing crew and they take my sailor. And once this pirate takes my sailor below deck, he takes him down below he takes him into the engine room, and then my crew and him jump him and take him as hostage, the pirate, the leader of the pirates. It, 
So now there, there were just two of my crew with the three pirates. This dance goes on, as I said, for about 12 or 13 hours on the ship. They keep demanding, what's the matter with the ship? Why won't it work? Why is it a piece of junk? Where's the crew? And they get more and more worried about their leader, who they don't know yet, that my crew has in the mask Alabama, keeps drifting. And I'm very clear about, about my responsibility. I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying to try to get control back in baby steps because truly I had lost all control of every type, never a good thing for any type of leader. And so I tried to give him cigarettes and sodas all along. I was trying to build a repair. That area of the world we call Marlboro country, it, it is a currency there. And so I just tried to take baby steps back in control, trying to get a rapport to, to try and, and help me get through this. And as I discovered a strength in me that I really wasn't sure I had, and I grow more and more impressed at the strength and resistance that my crew is displaying. So, so we keep talking, 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 the, the, the crew, the pirates and I on the handheld radio, and we come up with a solution. We'll help them get onto our rescue boat since they sank their skiff on, uh, on boarding our ship. And then we, we, we'll agree their attempt had failed and they could go, go on, their, on their way. As it turned out, they, they, they wanted someone for an exchange to go, go with them and also the rescue boat broke down, so we wound up getting in to the lifeboat. Now, uh, and, and this is the part of the talk where I have the biggest pleasure of clearing up things the media got wrong, which, which was a lot. Uh, uh, I, I didn't surrender myself as a hostage, some kind of sacrificial, heroic, fatted calf. I, I, uh, I, did, I wanted to, I believe that my major responsibility was to get these pirates off my ship. And I knew if I went with them, they, they, they couldn't get back on as they had lost their ladder. And in spite of everything that I'd been trained in all my years of sailing as a captain, that I should have been the last person off that ship, somehow I knew that the best course of action uh, and the best way I could protect my crew, my ship and my cargo, was to get these pirates off my ship. And, and the best thing uh, w w was what I intended to do. Ironically, uh, I think it also protected me. And I think in all our life's business, we've been trained to act in a certain way for some situations in which we may find ourselves. And I think it's very important that we all must ascertain what is the correct course of action in the current contemporary situation. Somehow I knew getting these pirates off the mask of Alabama was the way to go. And the fact is, without the assistance of one crew member to, uh, to to, to operate the davit, lower the boat, release the boat, and operate the, the boat in the water, the pirates couldn't leave my ship. So I decided that that crew member would be me. And the deal was I would get them on the way, we'd come back alongside, and we'd make the exchange, their leader, for me. And we'd all go on our merry way. And in all honesty, uh, I knew there was a pretty good chance they might keep me. But if they did, I'd only be responsible for one guy, me instead of all my crew. I've always considered myself a lucky guy, not especially intelligent or brave or anything all that, but I like the odds with, with, with just me. So for me to leave my ship and get on the lifeboat with the pirates wasn't surrender, nor was it something I view as an act of heroism. It was my strategy, it was my action plan, it was my duty. And that's the way it played out. I got them off, uh, the, in the rescue boat off the mask Alabama it broke down we got into our lifeboat we came back alongside to make the exchange my crew released the leader down into the lifeboat he came into the lifeboat and then they they, they didn't let me go it's another lesson I learned never trust a pirate yeah it was a disappointment uh, no one would want to be in a small enclosed lifeboat with four armed Somali pirates but I gotta say I like the look on these pirates' faces, these guys' faces, when the crew they couldn't find for the past 12 or 13 hours are now yelling at them in the, uh, from the main deck or talking to them on a handheld radio. And the ship, that was a pure piece of junk, a real lemon. Now the lights were snapping on, the stack started emitting smoke, and even we in the lifeboat could hear the rumble of the main engine. Now the chief engineer had the ship up and running and following us in the lifeboat. I show this slide just to give you an idea of, what, of how it was like. This actually was taken by one of my crew members of the very day, and that's the skiff that we saw at 0645. 
as you can see, there's very little swell to see you win. It truly was a perfect piracy day. And to say, uh, to say the least, the pirates weren't happy about that, uh, seeing the mask Alabama following us now, and they would take their displeasure out on me. However, my responsibility, my crew, my ship, my cargo were free and clear, although still in the piracy zone. So, and that's how I wound up on the lifeboat with the pirates. The, the configuration of the lifeboat interior is one center aisle with two seats on each side of that aisle. It's completely enclosed in fiberglass to protect you from the environment, and uh, which also makes it uh, very hot. The main way in is the aft vertical door, and then there's a secondary hatch up forward, like a sailboat hatch, horizontal. And uh, the pirates would, would always have two guys with AK-47s by that aft vertical door, one guy up forward by the hatch, one guy in the coxswain position above and abaft everybody, and, and that's where you steer the boat with, with the coxswain position. And they all spent their time uh, just watching me. I, I was convinced, I can remember s sitting on that port and that light bulb and thinking, Richard, it doesn't get any better than this. Uh, 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 I mean, it doesn't get any worse than this. Uh, nobody knows I'm out here, and uh, I I'm here with four knuckleheads with, with guns on me. Uh, I just did the mental math, and I figured there's no way someone's riding to my rescue. I figured I was on my own. However, I vowed I wouldn't quit. I, I realized if I gave in, if I quit, I'd become nothing but a hostage, just something they could murder for notoriety or ransom for money. If I didn't give, give up, I could play mind games with them, that they were playing with me. I, I would be their adversary instead of their, their, their hostage, and I thought I, I thought I could create a way to escape. I knew the Mask Alabama was going to trail us for a while that first night. They were behind us. And before my radio died, I called the now Captain Shane Murphy. And I said, hey, if you see a splash out the back door, that's me. Come and get me. Well, as it turned out, I, I didn't have a chance to get away that, that first night. I had to be flexible, refuse to give in, and wait until early in the morning of Friday, April 10th. At like 1 or 2 in the morning, doesn't everything seem to happen at O'Dock 30? One of the two pirates from the aft vertical door gets up, walks forward in the light boat, goes by me, lies down, and pretty soon I can hear what I think of two people snoring uh, in the bow. I'm now watching the leader. He's in the coxswain position. He's above and abaft me, and I'm watching him, and he's acting like he's had a bad movie. He's sort of drooping and dozing and nodding. And I'm thinking uh, I can get by him. I thought I was on my own, and I think this is another part of being a successful leader of any type, type comes into play. That's being flexible. In that lifeboat, I tried to do the same thing. My plan was pretty simple. Wait for the right moment and jump off that dang lifeboat. Uh, I'm trying to be flexible. All of a sudden, the lone pirate by the apparatical door, he gets up, he ducks out the hatch, he goes onto a small platform on the aft end, and I'm wondering myself, what in the heck is he doing? Perhaps some of you may have already guessed. Even pirates have to go to the bathroom. But for me, there was another lucky fact in his call of nature. Unfortunately, there's no delicate or refined way to explain it in mixed company other than to say that this pirate, this guy, is one of those guys who uses two hands when going. It was very important to me. It meant he had to put down his AK-47. Well, again, I can think, still sitting on that thwart, and I'm, I'm saying to myself, Rich, it doesn't get any better than this two snoring and sleeping, one nodding and dozing, one heating nature's call. I stop rubbing my legs to make sure I can stand. I finally stand, take two strides. I get by the guy in the coxswain position. I duck out the hatch. I push the pirate, had to push him twice. And he goes into the water, screaming. For a second there, I had a chance to grab that AK-47. But at the time, I, I didn't know how to use one. I do now. So I turn around, I dive in, I swim underwater, I come up, take a breath, take another breath, come up, I'm completely out of breath. I can see the Navy ship about a quarter mile away. I turn to the lifeboat, and there's, unfortunately, the now wet screaming pirates, his screams have awoken the three sleeping pirates. And again, as Easter is wont to do, that big, full, beautiful moon comes out behind the cloud, and it's like daylight on the ocean that, that night. They could see my head in the water, and they come, and they come after me. And... Uh, uh, as it approaches me, I dive under the lifeboat. I'm hanging on that pole that encircles that lifeboat or that lifeline. 
I'm listening to their foot, footsteps and their yells, and as it gets closer, I dive under. About the fifth time, I pop up in the starboard forward side, and unfortunately, one of the pirates is there with his AK-47. He fires once by my head, and I make another quick, flexible adjustment to my plans. I say, okay, okay, you got me, you got me. And they take me back aboard, and again, they, they were not happy. Punches to my head, hitting me with the butts of the pistol and the AK-47, yelling and screaming. They were irate. I didn't follow the proper procedures of a hostage. They then tied me up so tight. I have some numbness and scars on my wrist, then my ankles, yelling and screaming. They, they were irate. But it's amazing what happens when you vow you won't quit, when you won't quit. You, you refuse to give in. I don't know why it works that way. I just know that it does. When you vow you won't quit, sooner or later, something will happen to hopefully make your situation better. But not long prior to, to my ill-fated escape attempt was about the time the, the Bainbridge, number 96, showed up. Flashing lights, blowing sirens, startled the heck out of me and, and also the pirates. And from that point on, they were in the Navy, was in constant contact with the pirates, though I didn't know anything that was going on in, in that regard. And it was good to see the Navy boats come by uh, to check out the lifeboat, but I was still stuck in stifling heat with my hands bound so tight they were swelling up like balloons with four guys with guns on me. It was the night after the, the Navy arrived that the atmosphere in the lifeboat drastically changed. In the display of their own hijacked religion, they, they, the pirates started incantations back and forth to one another, and after seven, eight, maybe nine minutes, the leader gave the pistol to one of his guys and said, you do it. That guy went, went behind me. He started a mock ritual execution with a gun to my head. The next thing I knew, I hear with a loud, a loud noise, a shot, and I have blood in my head and starting to come down my face, but I'm still alive. Later, they told me, oh, we didn't shoot you. We just hit you in the head with a gun. And I said, oh, well, that's much better, guys. Thanks. From then on, I knew that whenever the hatches or doors closed, Something bad was about to happen. And the way I survived that was by meeting yet another and sometimes most important challenge of a leader of any kind, and, and that's staying calm. Uh, I don't think anyone ever solved a crisis at sea by losing their wits, so I had plenty of practice staying calm, and I worked at staying calm in, in that lifeboat. I know now that they were playing mind games with me. They were trying to get me to give in, surrender, and truly just become their hostage. Uh, but... Uh, and they wanted me to re just resign uh, my, my position. Uh, and during the whole time, I didn't get a lot of time by myself, but I realized that I never prayed for rescue. I asked God to give me the patience and strength that I would have the patience to wait and the strength to act when the time comes. When, when you're trying to stay calm, uh, a little faith does help. The fake executions were just one of the things the pirates did to mess with, mess with my mind. They spent untold hours upon hours having me tie and untie knots. They were constantly telling me that Somali uh, sailors were better than American sailors. They constantly reminded me that my family would miss me when I was dead, as if it was a foregone conclusion. The younger one with the wild Charlie Manson eyes, his favorite thing was to sit across me in the thwart in that lifeboat, point his AK at me, dry fire it, and then just grin at me. And we even had these conversations where they were working for the U.S. Navy and also my company. And they were just checking the security on my ship. And we even had this conversation as we neared the Somali coast. We could see the mountains out that app vertical door. As we neared the Somali coast, one of the taller pirates told me that when we arrived in Somalia, he'd take me to, to the movies and introduce me to his girlfriend's mom as my day. Well, it made me even more determined that to not give them the satisfaction of seeing me give, give in, so I'd play mind games with them. I could not, would not give up. As, as long as I was in the game, that's, that's all I asked for. I had a chance. And this went on in tense heat for a few more days. My world was pretty much the inside of the lifeboat and what I could see out that aft vertical hatch. I could see the Navy's presence as they came by for I me for signs of life, give us radios, give us water, give us some food. Uh, and I could hear the helicopters overhead through the broken windows, uh, but I could see that the pirates were starting to get spooked by the Navy's presence, whereas before they really weren't. And obviously there was a lot going on they didn't know. I didn't know anything about the ransom negotiations between the Navy and the pirates. And I knew the USS Bainbridge had taken the lifeboat under tow, but I didn't know why. 
All I knew was that I'm not going to give up. I vowed I would never give up. I decided I might die in that lifeboat, but it would be because the pirates had decided to take my life, not because I was going to quit and give it up. The three pirates raining on that lifeboat that Easter Sunday, and I could see the leader had gone to the Bainbridge to get care for his hand where my crew cut him when they took him as hostage and also to negotiate with the Navy. So he left very early in the morning that Easter Sunday, and that left the three other pirates by themselves. And during the whole four, four and a half days, at times they would give me water, times they wouldn't. Times they'd give me food, times they wouldn't. I never, ever cared about food, but water truly, truly became dear. And this Easter Sunday, they started playing their not dying games, and they shut me off of all water. So by early afternoon, I was, I was done with them. I was sick as a dog. I was getting seriously dehydrated. I said, I'm done playing your games. Uh, and they could see I was pretty sick. So they actually gave me some water. They undid the bindings that tied my wrist. And after I drank about a gallon of water, I, I, I started to, to, to feel a, a little better. But I could see the pirates were starting to lose it. They were, they were cussing at each other and coming to their blows almost as much as they were, were with me. Without that other pirate leader there who was on the Bainbridge, I could see they were really starting to lose it. And after a while, I felt better. I leaned over. I undid the bindings on my ankles. I stood up. And I said, I'm going to jump in the water get cool, something they'd been doing for, for the past four and a half days. And uh, they started yelling at me, sit back down, get your seat, sit back down. I said, I'm going to jump in the water to get cool. And then I gave them very basic instructions on what they could do to themselves. I took one, maybe two steps forward in the lifeboat. One, one pirate grabbed my leg, one my waist, when all of a sudden the younger one with a wild Charlie Manson eyes fired his AK into the air. It's impossible to describe how, how loud a noise that is in a small enclosed lifeboat. I'd come to recognize that sound, and it got my attention, and I did as they told me, and I sat back down. But that shot scared the two taller pirates as much as it scared me. They started yelling at the younger one, what did you do? What did you do? See, they knew if I was dead, there was nothing to keep the Navy from storming the lifeboat and killing the pirates. But as long as I was alive, however, they believed the pirates I mean, they believed the Navy, the government, would do a absolutely nothing. And sure enough, from outside the lifeboat, I hear a voice, an American voice, and it says, what's going on in there? What's the problem? I was fed up, uh, so I actually turned to lie down the center aisle. I'm on all fours. I'm facing forward. And two of the taller pirates are yelling out, relax, relax, no military action, no military action, relax, no problem, no problem. The younger one, as I said, he had a tough Easter Sunday. He's up in the windows, and he's sort of sulking. And that's when the shots rang out. I dove back right into my seat, and probably the only thing that would have been hit on me would have been my rear end. I was hugging that deck so hard. And the, the, the SEALs told me, after they took the initial shots, they thought they failed. They thought one of the pirates was alive, coming around uh, to finish me off. So they just kept firing into the lifeboat. I was able to let them know where I sat, so they were, they were able to avoid me. What was going on is... I thought I was caught in a crossfire between three crazy pirates, and they were shooting at each other from each end of the lifeboat, and I'm yelling out, what the heck are you guys doing? And that, that's what the SEALs heard. But the, initially, as I said, they thought they failed, and then one of their own slid down that tow rope and landed on that lifeboat. On his own, they, they said they didn't have a plan, but he was just trying to he help his buddies. And then, there, and then there was silence after days of constant taunting heat. It was just silence. And then a voice says, an American voice, is it safe? Are you all right? And he came down that forward hatch. It was a U.S. Navy SEAL sliding down, down that tow rope. And even, even though I, wasn't, I was being lifted up to the Bainbridge before I realized that I made it, I'm alive. I'm out of here. The real heroes of this story are our military and especially our U.S. Navy SEAL. The dedication they have to one, and one another and the precision in which they execute their mission proves beyond any doubt that a well-trained, focused, professional team can overcome most o any obstacle or solve most uh, any problem. Look, we, we have something in common, you and I. We both face challenge and change. Whether it's on the seas I encountered as the captain of the ship or the changing seas of business and economy, we're all riding on ever-shifting waves. And I can tell you from experience, you're better off to face that with a well-trained, committed crew than all by yourself alone.
uh, and, and this has an important lesson for us. These aren't easy times. They're tough. They're challenging. And as I said, they're always changing. And let's face it, they always will. Yet, you see, I have faith in you. I know from experience that you are stronger than you even know. If you commit yourself to see it through, to not surrender in the face of adversity, and unite with your colleagues as a dedicated team, then you too can overcome most any obstacle or obtain most any goal. If you'll just, as the old poet said, just see it through. I want to thank you, and may God bless you with calm and healthy seas ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. But uh, why, why do I suspect that that never gets dull in the telling over and over? That's quite, quite an adventure. We have a little time for questions. Um, let's take a couple from the audience here. Sir. Captain, if I may. The question is uh, to the captain is where, how did the Navy know where to shoot in the life raft, in the lifeboat? Well, in, in the lifeboat, uh, I, 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 there was one seat I wanted to be in, and, and to tell you the truth, I, I don't know why. Uh, I think it was a control thing because I had very little control in that lifeboat, but I, I wanted to sit uh, in that seat because I was two seats away from the door, and that, that was the biggest exit. And uh, if things started crazy, I, I just wanted to be close to that door. And still to this day, I don't know why. But at times they move me and they try to move me around. Uh, but I'd, I'd make some pretense and I'd end up, end up back in the seat. So when the Navy came by, there, there was no number on the seat. When the Navy came by, if I was there, I was usually tied up by then. And they go, where do you sit? I sit right here. This is where I sit. I sit here. And every time they came by, if I wasn't sitting there, you know, they would ask me, where do you sit? I sit right here, this is where I sit. Uh, so so that, that's how they, they, they actually knew. And, you know, a couple of times they, they had come uh, and, you know, they would give us water or food. And at one point they said, hey, Rich, where do you go to the bathroom? And I just uh, started laughing. I said, hey, don't let me do that. Uh, and then what they wanted me to do is go out onto the platform and then they died they grabbed me and then they had guns hidden. Well, I thought they were just regular Navy and what they were were Navy SEALs. Uh, I've since uh, uh, it come to meet most of those guys. And these guys were all shaved, close cropped head. They had the shoulder insignia. So I never assumed that they were Navy SEALs, but that's how they knew what, what seat I was in. Because it, as I said, I don't know why to this day, I thought I had to do that, but that was the one control I really had of a place I had no control. Questions? Sir. Oh, uh, it I suppose you could say that, but but that's another irony that I still wonder today. And that's one thing I asked them in the lifeboat. I go, where'd you get that ladder, the Mogadishu Home Depot? Because the the, iron, the irony of the ladder is we had, I believe it was 19 feet freeboard. And the reality of the ladder is had it been longer, it would have been wiped off. Had it been shorter, they wouldn't have been able to get up. So it was just irony that that ladder was, I mean, eventually the water did wipe it off the side, but that, 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 that was the irony of, uh, how they got aboard, they had that ladder was somehow the, the you know, the perfect size. So, uh, you know, that, that, that is one thing I, I wondered about. As far as uh, the rest of it, I mean, their, their skips are going 20 to 23 knots. We, we, my maximum speed was about 18 and a half. Uh, and really, if you remember that picture of the skiff there, really it was the weather, it was the environment. The day before, we were followed by three skips, and, and we got away from them. 
um, much like you saw in the movie, because of the weather. But that morning when it picked up, and uh, Shane Murphy, uh, you know, said, "Boy, I can't wait for this monsoon to change." Uh, th that's what we're waiting for. We like rough weather in that. We like rain. Because uh, pirates don't come out in that weather. So we like the rough weather. Okay, another question. Ma'am, and, and bear with me, let me repeat the question for the Zoom audience after you ask it. So the, uh, the lady is asking if the captain, if he went back to sea after this adventure, and for how long? Uh, it did take me about 14 months to get back to sea. Uh, my phone basically rang off the hook from 6 in the morning to 10 at night for the first uh, two months. I no longer answer my phone uh, from, from, the, from that experience. Uh, so uh, initially, I had so many people just asking me for things, and I actually started a little speaking. They came to me about a book and a movie, and we were doing, doing uh, that negotiation to talk. Uh, I expected to get back to work, because I just joined the ship uh, eight days before. So uh, I expected to go back to work myself, because i got to make a living. Uh, and uh, I didn't get back for 14 months. You gotta remember, I'm on a 90-day schedule, so you can't just bump the guy off in front of you. So uh, a guy came in and relieved me, and then I, I ended up, when I went back to sea 14 months later, uh, I was on another ship that was going around the world uh, uh, for, for the same company that, that I work for. So it, 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 I retired about six years ago, but I sailed another four and a half, just under five years after that. Okay. I'd like to remind the home audience that uh, they may enter questions by tapping the Q&A button at the bottom of their screen and typing in a question. Take another one from here. Sir? Uh, so, excuse me, let me... Uh, this is probably not the gentleman to interrupt, is it? Um, and I don't even have an AK. I've just... <laughs> the, the question was, after the incident, uh, how was the captain debriefed, and was the information used to, uh, to prevent further piracy incidents? Go ahead. Uh, I, I did talk to military intelligence on the ship, uh, maybe two days, three days later. I mean, but I don't think we talked for more than a minute and a half. I didn't really think that uh, they really were concerned with it. Uh, as far as uh, shipping, I, I think you, you got to remember, even on ships then, I had uh, senior crew, crew members who really still didn't believe in the pirates. I mean, they said, oh, that's a Johnny Depp thing. So you really had to get the... Get, uh, get the people then. After my experience, you never had to cue the people. Everyone was sort of hot on the subject. Everybody wanted to do, do the right thing. So whenever anything happens, that's always the case. But, you know, complacency seeps in, and uh, uh, it's, it's still going on off the Horn of Africa. There hasn't, hasn't been anything taken, but, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're taking ships off Nigeria and still off the uh, Malacca Straits. And stuff. So it's still going on. I call it the second oldest profession that we come in contact with with frequently uh, in the Merger Marine, so uh, it's still going on. Uh, but, but as far as the training, no, uh, I have done a little training with the uh, military. They actually, uh, I did some things with the Defense Department maybe about a month later, and I'm still doing some things with, with some other groups, uh, uh, you know, when they have questions or certain procedures that we do. But, but really, and that's one of the things I like working for the company I work for, Waterman Steamship or Central Gulf Lines, is once you took the lines off and you went to sea, it was just you and the 18 or 19 or 20 people on the ship. That, that was it. That's the community. And, uh, and that's all you got, really, uh, uh, to, to really help them. Uh, so for me, it was, it, it, was, uh, it was good to get back to sea and be in that, that environment. Uh, and I just learned some of the things I learned for those two days, uh, you know, from avoiding the pirates, I started using that and, and, and more things. But really, it's up to the captain. The captain can be as active as he wants or as inactive as he wants. I was lucky. I had a chief mate, Shane Murphy, and a chief engineer, uh, Mike, and they were very active in training. So that, that, that's, uh, that, that's why the, the crew was instrumental in their safe outcome as well as mine. The crew did a great job.
Okay, I have uh, several questions from the Zoom audience. Uh, the first one is, how do you respond to the charges that you put your ship in danger by being too close to Somalia? Oh, I, I really didn't have to answer that. It was the farthest I'd ever been off the coast of Somalia. Actually, I had tele, uh, emails uh, coming from Mask asking me why it was taking so long. You gotta remember, when I first got on that route four, four and a half years ago, it would take me three and a half, four days to go to Mombasa. Now it was taking me eight days. And I told the guy, in a few weeks, it's gonna be taking us two weeks. Uh, and I explained to him that there were pirates. Uh, uh, so there was, uh, uh, after, two weeks after the incident, there were 11 suits that were filed. I think it was 53 million against uh, mainly the company, but they were blaming me. I was too close to the shore. I was trying to save gas. I, I could have got away from the pirates, but I didn't want to. It was three days of a, te of a, of a, a testimony for me uh, with, with all the lawyers. And, and, uh, it, it, and I'll be honest, when I was rescued, I told the Navy captain, he goes, they should give more money now because it, there's going to be a suit coming. It's, it's just the way it is. So for me, uh, it's the farthest I'd ever been off, off the coast. Uh, we were going farther and farther each time. We, we had input. Uh, so, so really, it was uh, just a... Uh, a, a man to try and get money. Thank you. Kim Baressa asks, did your wife and kids agree with your decision to get back on a ship? Uh, I, I think they did. Andrea's right over there. I mean, you, you got to remember, that's all I did. That's all I knew. I liked going to sea. I liked the challenge. And so for me, I always thought I was going back. I, I didn't believe it would take me that long to get back. Uh, so, uh, but my wife had said, "Whatever you, whatever you want to do." Uh, uh, and really, it was no, no decision of mine. I knew I was going back. Okay. I, um, questions are moving on me. Uh, Parker asked, "What happened to the ship? Did it continue on the rest of its planned journey?" Uh, the, the ship continued under, under Captain Murphy. Uh, he, he became the captain. He took it uh, with a contingent of army uh, of Marines. Uh, and they went to Mombasa for about, I think they were there for almost two months. And th this goes back to the question about, you know, did they listen to things? Uh, and they really did. The company didn't mask. Uh, they, they had all these uh, crazy ideas. One of them was to seal off our swimming pool, put a heater in it, run pipes all up on the port, stop its side. And uh, then when the pirates came, you could uh, heat the water up and then squirt them with hot water. And so the first time they tested it, it worked, it worked good. It worked for about three minutes. And, uh, and then they had to stop to fill a swimming pool up. So initially, they really don't listen to the people on the ships, but it's up to the people on the ships to get that point across. Uh, another one from the Zoom audience. Um, have you stayed in touch with the crew? Uh, not really. Eleven of them uh, sued me and disparaged me, so I have no desire to talk to them. A few I have met, my bosun. Uh, actually, I was on a ship, and we ran into each other. We gave a hug. We have a little talk. Uh, uh, and, and then my chief mate, Shane Murphy, still active. Uh, I haven't heard from him in a few years, but I know I'm following him. He's a captain also on the, with a different company, APL, so he's doing very good. Uh, really much, uh, the rest of the crew I really don't keep in touch with. Because you got to remember, I got on the ship seven days, eight days before. I knew the chief mate for about a month, the chief engineer for a month and a half. The first engineer I, I, I knew for a little while. And other than that, I didn't know anybody else. Uh, so, so really, it, it, they, they weren't people I really knew. We went through a tough time together. And, and some of the officers I see, I, uh, you know, if I, I run into them, I, I do talk to them. But yeah, regardless of that, the crew did a great job. Uh, one more question from here, sir, in the back. Uh, the relationship we had was pretty professional. Uh, I, I consider him a friend. Uh, like I said, he, he's still working. Uh, uh, he, he, he's a, he, he was a good mate. Uh, he, he was, uh, he was young, but, but he was a go-getter. He's a very smart guy. Uh, so I enjoyed sailing with him. Uh, I've sailed with a lot of chief mates and 
not all of them were like that. So uh, Shane Murphy, he, he definitely took uh, an interest, which not everybody does, into the drilling, the training. He would actually get involved, where a lot of times it was just me. Uh, and it really helps to have three, four guys, uh, uh, you know, training and being involved. Because I think the crew sees that, and they see how important you are. So, uh, and, and without the, the upper officer's help, uh, uh, for those of you at home, that was a follow-up to the to the previous question. Um, we're going to uh, hold, stop the questions at that point. Um, and Liz, may I ask you to, to come up and uh, present our gift to the captain for his for his thank you, Liz. This is a token of our thanks for providing this memorable experience for our audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm also pleased to announce that uh, in honor of this evening, an anonymous donor has contributed $1,000 to the Captain Richard Phillips Lane Kirkland Maritime Trust in honor of Captain Phillips and his talk tonight. So, it's very generous. Thank you for joining us tonight at tonight's Ed Fui Speaker Series presentation of A Captain's Duty. This program has been recorded and a few days will be available on our website, chathammarconi.org. I hope that you will come to Chatham and visit the Marconi RCA Wireless Museum to learn about the history of maritime communications and also to join us for upcoming Speaker Series events. Details about the center and its programs are available on our website. Thank you again for joining us and good night.